Wow, this is like uh, opening the main star, really. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing how you always feel the, feel the crowds. What are you doing? Welcome. <laughs> Of course, mister, it's coming. Um, <laughs> who knows this, this little thing? Open dime. Raise your hands. All right, I'm not a paid chill uh, for Rodolfo, uh, but I like this little thing. It's a better asset for Bitcoins. It's uh, the most uh, private peer-to-peer, face-to-face way to to hand over Bitcoins to someone else without making a trace on the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, privacy and you know hiding your transactions has always been uh, uh, of the interest of many researchers. And even before even Bitcoin started and before it was cool, there was a lot of other researchers putting a lot of thought into how to make uh, completely censor ship resistant and uh, anonymous and fast and scalable and cheap transactions online. But there's some people that claim to know how to do it even offline. And that's Smuggler who's coming to talk today. He's a, he's a, a quality assurance for every time he's talking on this event. It's, a, it's an excellent talk. So I'm really excited to welcome him again. He's a privacy extremist. Uh, He's a cypherpunk and crypto anarchist, if I may say that, for 25 years. He's been doing a lot of research in, in the area of uh, privacy and a lot of uh, projects uh, that he's been participating in. Uh, but this one is his oldest project, now finally coming to the world and fruition. So please give a welcome to Smuggler. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm always not sure why so many people come to my talks, and um, I'm trying my best to not disappoint you t this time. Um, I usually don't give technical talks, so this is the most technical talk I've ever given at HCPP, so bear with me, please. No, no jokes and stuff. There is a thing, and that is the forgotten art of anonymous digital cash. You know, there was a time before the blockchain. I'm not sure if anybody of you is old enough to remember that, but the blockchain hasn't been there forever. And a lot of people in the, in the crypto anarchist scene today and media and whatever actually believe that no digital money existed before Bitcoin came along. And I am old. I remember the days before the blockchain. We didn't have uh, stuff like UTXOs. Um, and I kind of want to introduce you to a little bit of my history, like how I grew up with Crypto Anarchy, and a project that I've been on and off involved in, or actually um, a technology, not necessarily a project. Because I want to tell you about a past that has been forgotten by everybody who can spell blockchain. And in a way, it's not just a past, but I'd like to present to you an alternative reality on how to do digital anonymous payments very fast. Now, before we do all of that, we should kind of remind ourselves what um, this whole value and money and currency is about. So when we're talking about money, we're talking about uh, two things. We're talking about the uh, VTS, which is value transfer systems in general. So a value transfer system is what allows you to use money. It doesn't really matter that you have a piece of paper that says 10 euros when you're not able to transfer it to somebody else. Money that you cannot pay with is no money. And then you have certain functions that money kind of should represent. You have the value itself, you know, valueless money is no money. You know, if it doesn't buy you anything, it is no good. Then you have to be able to transfer it, as I said before. And ideally, you also want to storage it, because not all value that is um, transferable is also storable. So for example, 
um, being at the conference is a valuable thing. Um, but it's, uh, it's also transferable, you can invite people, but you cannot store the experience, you know, except for your memory. So, that's one thing. But the other thing is that monies can come in very different form, even if we call them the same, by the same name. But I'll come back to that later. That's really important. Okay, when you're talking about digital money, and especially money that is not that um, government approved, we have certain risks that come along with that. So the, the, the fundamental risk everybody knows about money is this thing called theft, you know? You have this 10 euro um, sitting on the table in front of you, you go to the loo and you come back, it's not there anymore. That's called theft or paying your bill. Um, then you have the whole issue of technical and operational risks. If you're issuing money, if you're operating a bank, whatever, things can go wrong, you know? Your building burns down, uh, the only admin that knew the password to the database runs in front of the bus, stuff like that. So you have certain risks in operation. Then you have something that I think we're often not aware of, and that is the whole thing of lock-in and monoculture. So imagine PayPal was the only way you can pay. Nobody is laughing. Imagine it, you know, it, that's like the definition of horror, you know. You might be able to pay and in a certain low probability you might actually receive the money paid to you. And then you have this issue that there are people that issue money that you cannot trust. Because they discover, hey, instead of robbing a bank, I'm going to open one. You know, and then I'm gonna claim that you know the money you paid in on your account is actually there. Just don't ask for it ag again. You know, just look at the number and be happy with that. You know, but don't ask me for a return. And then you have fungibility. What worth is any money if the person you want to pay says, "Oh, you know what, your money that kind of stinks." You know, it's maybe affiliated with the wrong business? Have you laundered it well? You know, so that is fungibility. But when you're dealing with the government, you have a real issue. That is government risk. Personally, I consider the government as one of the biggest risks that exists on this planet. That was a cheap one, I know, but thank you. <laughs> because governments have this tendency to go around and say, you know what, you shouldn't be issuing money, and by the way, give me all you have. You know, that seems to be a modus operandi of those groups. And then you have this privacy issue. It, it kind of privacy would be an issue without governments as well, but with governments, privacy is a real big issue. You know, if the government can say, oh yeah, you paid for a natural occurring plant, you know, and you go for jail to, uh, to for doing it, that is a privacy risk, you know. You want to be able to make payments without going to jail for them most of the time. And then there's, I put the market in there. So what the market is, that's all the people on the planet kind of making decisions about what to do individually, and then you have an accumulation of behavior, and what really is the outcome of that, nobody of us can tell. So the market has tendencies like being irrational much longer than you're funded, or um, choosing the second best option and not the first best option, and stuff like that. So no matter how good your systems are and what you do, you might still fail. And that, all these things, all these risks, are things you take into account when you design a system. But you also take into account function. Remember the first, second slide, you know, you have to transfer, you have to store, you have to have value. Most blockchain currencies have turned in their history into making the decision that storing money is more important than transferring it. So it's really important to keep your money and to keep the value of your money, maybe. But sending the money and making that, that trivial and private and whatever is something 
that is like a second issue in a lot of um, developments today. Now, as I said before, same slide, second one, I think, you know, there are different kinds of money. You know, just because we call something euro or US dollar doesn't mean that it's the same money. It's the same currency, it's not the same money. Because monies come in different forms. So, for example, let's take a bank. You can have different kinds of euros in the bank. So the thing that most people think what they do when they give money to the bank is that they do a deposit. But depository money means that the bank takes your money, puts it into a safe, and writes your name on it. That is a depository. Most banks never do that for you because all of us are not rich enough for getting that service. What we do is we have G gyro or debt money. You know, um, gyro money is you give the bank uh, money, and the money just promises uh, the bank just promises you to maybe give it back to you. But in the meantime, it has better uses for your money than you do. So that is gyro. And as you can see, these are different characteristics of money. And I think it is important to keep that in mind, because we we're talking about cryptocurrencies. We usually don't make separation of function. We say, we want to have one system that implements all the possible functions of money and all the types of money in one single system. And that makes design really complicated. But what you could instead do is to have a movement between functions. So instead of saying, I have a system that is optimized for everything, you have multiple systems that interlink and say, I have this system that is good for storage, and this system is great for anonymous sub-second payments. Anybody of you having done a sub-second payment recently? On what? Okay, thank you. Confirmation, thank you. <laughs> so, as I said before, most blockchain currencies today are focusing on the storage part and not on the transfer part. What I would like to do is go back in history to something called a DBC. Who of you has ever heard that term DBC? So we have exactly 10 people under um, over 40 here. Thank you. So imagine that before we had blockchains, crypto anarchists and cypherpunks were actually uh, thinking about different kinds of uh, digital money. And one fundamental solution they came up with was the DBC, the what the fuck is that? It's a digital bearer certificate. Now, bearer certificates are something you know from bank, no, well, bankers know from banking, you know? It's where you have an authority that certifies certain properties, like value or currency or expiration date or similar. Now, we can have those certificates in a way that are digital and that are um, cryptographic. It's basically like a check. If the non-US people don't know what a check is, that's a piece of paper that says, um, if you hand this slip of paper in, the bank gives you 100 euros from my bank account. So that is basically what that is. It's a digital form of check. So. These DBCs are really simple. They have a few functions only. So the base function is you have to create those DBCs. That's issuing. Then you have to be able to spend them. You know, that means they're not valid anymore. And then there are certain uh, overlay functions. You know, if you have a DBC for 10 euros, you might want to change it into two DBCs for five euros, stuff like that. So as you can see, there are only two core functions in operating in such a system. So the question is, how does such a system work in detail? You have a string of data, you know, bits and bytes, and they represent nothing else but the properties of the certificate. They say, this is 10 euros owned by smuggler, or 1 million euros owned by smuggler. <coughs> And you have an authority that signs that. The authority is whoever claims that they will give you back the money. And it's a digital signature. 
sounds trivial enough. And it comes with problems, of course, everything comes with problems. So what happens in the digital world? In the digital world, you never steal things, really, you only copy them, you know, but if you have something that contains value and you copy it, it becomes theft. So what happens if I have a certificate that says that the issuer owns, owes me 100 Euro, oh, no, 1 million euros, um, and I make a copy of that and I go back to the issuer and say, hey, I have like these two things, you know, each of them says you give me uh, 1 million euros. That is the issue of double spend. And I recently read an article about Bitcoin saying Bitcoin was the first time double spend was solved. No, it wasn't. I'll come back to that later. Then you have the issue of privacy. You know, you have this string of bits with a signature behind it. It's issued, it's digital. Of course, it's trackable, you know. I memorized what I gave you. Attach your name to it, you know, and have this record. Okay, whoever comes back to me with this certificate got the certificate from A. So I have a trace of what you're doing, whom you are paying. And then the third issue, and that is issuer fraud. Issuer fraud means the issuer claims or issues more money than it has any justification for. It invents money out of thin air. And I would say that out of these three problems that mostly exist everywhere, Bitcoin was the first one that solves the third issue in a distributed, decentralized manner. But there are other solutions. Double spend. How do you prevent against double spend? It's really easy. You just memorize what you've already spent. That's the same thing that Bitcoin does. You know, you have a transaction that refers to an unspent output of a transaction. You mark it as spent, and then nobody else can spend it. There's no reason why you can't do that with any simple database. You know, just record the DBC that you received, say it has been spent, you know, and in the future, I'll never recognize that DBC again. Super trivial. I don't have to go through the details here, right? So. Second thing, privacy. This is really interesting. So privacy in a payment system should actually mean that when I get money from somebody, that somebody doesn't know that I got money, or at least no third party does. And when I spend it to somebody else, when I send somebody else the money, that other party shouldn't be able to prove to anybody that it came from me, nor should a third party be able to, uh, to see that transaction. And in DBC systems, that is relatively easy. Because we had a dude um, called David Chom, who sadly didn't speak at this conference, who said, hey, we can build this system, you know, DBCs, digital bearer certificates, but we do them with blind signatures. Blind signatures are magic. Because blind signatures mean you can have a cryptographic signature on something, but the dude who signs it doesn't know what he signed. He cannot know that. And actually what you really want is a blind and unlinkable signature. Because unlinkable means he can't even say, oh yeah, I have the signed certificate and there somewhere in the past I had the signing event and they two belong together. A blind, unlinkable signature allows you to make a signature and never be able to put the signing event and the signed message together again, ever. And that is cryptographically provable, actually. So, this comes with an issue. If I am issuing this certificate and I don't know what the certificate says, then anybody can just, you know, come by and say, hey, sign this thing, please, you know? And how do I know if it's worth 10 euros or a million euros? I don't. Because I, as a signer, cannot actually know what I sign. Now, there have been multiple approaches to, you, uh, to uh, combat that kind of fraud, you know, where the user basically tries to betray the bank. Um, the most famous uh, protocol for using that is actually by David Chom, who uh, deserves a little bit of a, a shout out for all of this. Um, and his approach, his first approach was, 
you know what, instead of doing the signature once or you know, sending this um, blind message to the bank once, instead the user should send a thousand of those. And then the bank says, hey, reveal the actual clear text of those um, messages in 999 cases. And if they are all true, then I will sign the last one. It's a probabilistic approach, and it requires that if you, recover, uh, if you discover that a user is trying to defraud you, you have to punish him. So that means that the first DBC systems were actually account-linked. So people had an account with an issuer, then we would withdraw money from that account to a DVC. And while withdrawing, they would make this proof that whatever they was, was, were withdrawing was actually honest. And if it wasn't, the bank would punish them by subtracting money from their account. This is not a very efficient solution. Um, and it's something where you cannot escape fraud completely. There have been other approaches, I'm not going to get into them, because I'm going to get into the one that I like most, because it's trivial, and that is simply distinguish properties like value and currency by signing key. Instead of signing random statements of this much is what I own, make a signature that says, I owe you 100 euros, and I'm bank whatever. That doesn't require any probabilistic reveal, it doesn't require any proofs, it's really simple, it's one easy transaction. I talk to the issuer, the issuer makes a signature, I get it back, I unblind it, I have money. So, this is the solution that I like most. But then, there's this little issue that all the DBC uh, systems we had in the past were run by a single party. Because blind signatures have a few problems. One of them is we don't know about any scheme to have accumulative digital uh, blind signatures that are unlinkable and efficient. We don't have the crypto for it yet. There are thoughts about that when it comes to very, how do you say it, exotic encryption but people dealing with en uh, encryption don't like the term exotic encryption. That's usually the stuff that it gets broken by a teenager 10 years later. <clears throat> so, um, we have always have this issue, or had this issue, that a bank could invent money. We don't want that. We don't want the, man uh, the bank to say, oh, you know what, I have this hidden stash of unlimited money, because they're gonna just make a few more signatures and invent money. It's not in our interest. Now, <laughs> I'm involved with a little group of people. Um, in Berlin, we have this little thing, Container TAZ, um, where we're trying to build a place that is resistance against uh, surveillance, where we can experiment with things. And we had an issue there, and that is where installing toilets. I know it's a, a heavy uh, technology there, and because it's so expensive and complicated, of course you cannot have free toilets. You have to pay for taking a, you know, a dump. Because of, you know, you have to, to manage the uh, storage capacity of the tanks, you know, you have to pay the people that pay for, uh, that clean the toilets. So we're in front of this issue and saying, okay, how do we solve that? And the result of that was a completely over-engineered solution, as usual, and that is a distributed blind signature digital bearer certificate system that can do things like 2,000 transactions on a laptop in a second. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and I'll go a little bit into the techni uh, technicalities. So, this is basically for all those people who are interested in a little bit more tech, and it's a demonstration of simplicity and triviality. So how do we record um, spend certificates, and how do transactions look like? So in our system, a transaction consists of a valid DBC, which we use to pay. It might consist of a return, 
that you want to have, another DBC. Um, it contains a, um, an owner proof. You know, you want to have money that only belongs to you, so you sign your money and say, okay, this is my money. And it contains all the signatures of the issuers and some parameters that are not that important. But all these things basically make one uh, transaction. The transaction is relatively small, it's a few hundred bytes. And the thing we do is we record a hash of that transaction, link the unique parameters to it, that is line two and three, and out of that you get a database that allows you to replay transactions whenever you see the same transaction. It's indempotent. Meaning, you create a transaction once, you send it to the system, if the system is down, it doesn't matter, you just repeat. And you can actually repeat it as often as you want, you always get the same result. If the money is spent, you get a ha-ha, no money. Um, and if you're actually doing it in exchange, you get the same signed certificate back. Which means that you don't have to keep much state on the client, you have to no synchronization between the client and the servers, you don't have any synchronization between the servers, and you really don't care if the internet works at that moment or not. Signing. So signing is, as I said, an issue. Blind signatures distributed over many, um, uh, blind signatures over many issuers is, is a kind of unsolved issue. So we turned it around and said, you know what? Instead of having one signature that one issuer does, we have many issuers that simply do the same signature, uh, their own signatures on the same data. So instead of having your properties and one signature, you have your properties and a lot of signatures. And those signatures simply come from different parties. And what you can do with that is you can build a system that is widely distributed that is completely untraceable and that is totally trivial because it only has those two rules on how to sign something. So you sign a DVC either if you've never seen it or you know the hash of the complete transaction, that is what I was saying before, and you have signed the inputs yourself or a quorum of all other issues, issuers has signed this transaction. Just think about those two rules. What those two rules mean is that you cannot make any transaction in the system unless a quorum of all participants in the system, signers in this uh, system, agree. But this also means that all those signing parties in the system actually don't have to talk with each other. The whole synchronization in the system just happens by the user making a transaction. No bank has to talk to another bank. No issuer has to talk with another issuer. The only thing that you do is you define two little rules and you have one client that by his action synchronizes all issuers. If a few of those issuers are down, it doesn't matter. You can just replay the transaction. As I said before, idempotent uh, transactions. You just repeat. And the only interesting part there is that you have to set the quorum high enough. So if you would set the quorum under 50%, then people could start inventing money. But if you set it high enough, um, you can actually um, guarantee that you have to have a decision, an almost democratic decision, by all issuers for anything, not just a transaction itself, but also for inventing money. In this system, no single party can just say, I'm going to make money out of thin air. But instead, the parties have to come together and decide on creating money. So, a few properties of that system, and I'm trying to um, keep it short here. So, I said the first few things already. There's a third thing that is kind of uh, always important. You know, we often design systems and then we think about governance. And since we're really lazy in our work, we just uh, took a technology that was already about handling quorums. It's actually about auditing code, but hey, what the hell, you know? So we used CodeChain by our beloved Frank Brown um, to organize the whole system of issuers. 
Then the second thing that should be mentioned is my laptop, which is a three, four, five-year-old uh, ThinkPad, makes about 2,000 transactions as an issuer in this system per second. And the only limiting factor, other than processing, is latency. So if you're able to connect to one of those mints with 50 milliseconds um, latency, like how long does it take to talk to you? A transaction will take 150 milliseconds. Um, translate that globally, uh, the global median uh, for um, latency on the internet is 250 milliseconds, so if all the issuers are distributed equally over the whole globe, by latency, you actually have a transaction in 750 milliseconds, and it's completely settled and co-signed by a lot of parties. It is extremely cheap. We don't have to store a lot of data. The only thing we kind of store is those 280 bytes per DVC. And the storage of these 280 bytes is relatively interesting because it's linearly scalable, exactly as the signing operation is itself. So you can work with clusters. It's relatively trivial distributed programming and it allows you to use extremely cheap storage technology. We don't need anything that has fast access. We can use probabilistic data structures to find values. And this means that billions of transactions can be done still by my laptop. It's really efficient. So a normal DBC is about 128 bytes long. And then every signer in that system adds about 33 bytes. So that means that if you have a 1,000 signers in the, uh, such a system, um, you still are around 3.3 kilobytes for a transaction, meaning that two packages can contain the whole transaction. You have 1,000 independent parties making sure that your system still works. Then it is completely anonymous. Blind signatures. Unlinkable blind signatures mean that nobody knows what happens to whatever certificate you receive from the system. You can send it to another party, the party cannot link it to the signing event, the issuers cannot link it to the signing event, uh, event. it is completely untraceable. And the interesting thing is that the anonymity set there is really big. In most systems we're using on blockchain right now, the anonymity set for most transactions is relatively limited. It's um, often extremely limited. So uh, it might be only a selection of a few alternative users of the system, like Monero, where you have a handful of alternative users that could be responsible for your transaction. In a lot of cases, the anonymity set is not much m uh, bigger than the number of transactions in the block. In our case, the anonymity set of each transaction is as big as all transactions in the key lifetime of the signer, which can be months, and which can be billions of transactions, depending on use. Okay, nobody goes to the toilet that much, but you have an anonymity set that is uh, extremely high. And the key lifetime is only defined by how long do I want to store data as an issuer. If, um, if I have a lot of storage, I might be able to do 1,000 transactions per day for every person on this planet and still do it for a whole year with my laptop. I can get two laptops and then I have an anonymity set of two years. I can do it with four laptops and so on, you, you get the point, right? So, and then there's a nice little feature of those systems and that is they're half offline capable. Half offline capable means it doesn't require both parties to be online to actually know that a transaction is valid and can be settled immediately. Um, specifically, this allows you to have point of sales terminals that don't have to be connected to the internet at all. You basically get a payment, you can verify the payment locally immediately because it's just a signature um, verification plus have you seen that DBC yourself before and does it have certain properties and that's it. And then you know that you've got a valid payment. 
So you're not uh, reliant on does the Wi-Fi at HTTP work. But instead, you just distribute your point of sales terminals in your store, you receive payments, and then at the end of the day, you might synchronize them to the network, or maybe a day later, or a day later, or a day later. So it works in reverse, by the way, as well. Um, you can actually use the system with wallets that never go online. They only receive data and they make payments, but they never have to be online. Which brings us to the future and the super cheap hardware wallets. Remember, these are all strings with a few signatures. And you only have to verify them when you get them, not when you spend them. You actually don't have to do any calculations to make a payment with this system, only when you receive money, which allows you to basically have uh, a USB storage stick as your hardware wallet. It's just files that you have to store. And the only thing you have to make sure when you make a payment is that you select the right files to transfer to the point of sales terminal, which means that you could have a hardware wallet for physical payment for something like five US dollars, and it still be secure. Now, what's coming is exactly that. We haven't uh, worked too much on hardware wallets yet. Um, another thing that we're working on is the ability to have atomic swaps between this system and Bitcoin. So you can transfer money between Bitcoin and this system um, without the involvement of third party and without complication. Um, there's one thing to add to that, and that is we're not 100% sure where this is going. Um, as I said before, it's an over-engineered solution for paying for going to the toilet. Then we have this little uh, thing that's called DBC swaps, which allow you to have uh, secure transactions between uh, multiple currencies in latency time, which allows you to have DBCs like um, take a shit, or use the Wi-Fi or pay for a drink. You have different currencies for that. You can swap them automatically uh, on in the system. And then there's another uh, slightly out there thing, which we thought about mostly because we thought it's cool. And that is you can have a distributed system as your own wallet. You know, you just take a few Raspberry Pis, you distribute them over the world, and they um, basically make sure that your money is safe and accessible. They just talk to the system all the time, and they don't need privileges, because none of those <coughs> little Raspberry Pis ever has enough information to steal your money. So you could host that actually in a park if you want to. Then there's this uh, distributed secret smart contracts, which is based on the same thing. Um, since you have these, these uh, little strings of signatures, uh, of sets of signatures, you can cut that in part and say, okay, every um, participant only gets one signature. It doesn't get the quorum amount of signatures. You just um, attach a little bit of code to it, you know, to do reissues. And if all those instances where you run the code with one of those signatures agrees, then you have a transaction. If not, then not. That is basically a very simple smart contract that doesn't have to run on the blockchain at all. And now about a few, I have five minutes and I kind of just want to... Three. I have five minutes. So Three. I told you that I'm coming from an alternative reality and I'm done with script so far. I kind of want to take you one step into the future. And that is, in the olden days, one of the things the cypherpunks talked about was how do we actually build hardware that is trustable? You know, all these things we do with blockchains and whatever are we're doing because we don't trust anybody and we cannot trust anybody. But what if we could trust our computers? Imagine. So that is actually a question that is uh, mainstream now. And it's not mainstream for blockchain currencies. It's mainstream for cloud computing. You want to make sure that the code you're running in the cloud is only accessible by you, not by the cloud provider, and so on and so on. And this has led to a lot of development in the last few years. Anonymous attestation, encrypted RAM, and verifiable software. Imagine you can trust your computer. So what is remote attestation? Remote attestation only means that through the internet, I can ask a different computer and say, are you a computer? 
and can I trust you? And this computer can answer and can say, yes, I am, and I can prove it. That's the short version of it. Now combine that with RAM that is encrypted. You cannot listen to the RAM anymore. You have this black box computer, and you go there physically, and you want to steal its secrets, and you can't because the RAM is encrypted. Damn it. So the third thing is verifiable software. That's a thing I have no clue about. But in theory, it says that you can prove that a certain implementation of a software is the same as the specification for the software. That software is doing exactly and nothing else than what the specification says. No backdoors. What does that mean? That means that we could, in theory, go ahead and say, OK, each one of us has a little bit of a computer black box. <coughs> we put it into our homes. And we run whatever software we want on it and prove that only this software works. We don't have to jump through many hoops to make it un uh, trustworthy. But instead, we can say that the computer itself and the software is trustworthy. And we might get there, and that means that all the effort we do with blockchains and with Scrit might actually be a waste of time in 10 years. If our computers actually become trustworthy, then we might run any kind of software secretly, mobile, quickly, on every computer. And the only thing you need script for then is to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you, Smuggler. Amazing talk as usual. One question I did not really understand uh, well. You have a federation of issuers at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? You said a quorum of eight of 10, so let's say we have 10 of them. How do you want to distribute the, the initial keys, or is that something that you have not There's no about? initial key distribution. Okay. So um, I did not understand well. Yeah, OK. Uh, I'm, I mean, it's a complex system I have tried to put into 30 minutes, you know? OK. okay. So <laughs> there's no key distribution. Um, the only thing that every instant does is create its own keys, and it's used for signing. And the, the only coordination issue you have to do once is to say who starts the whole process. You know, who are the first 10 users that run such a system? That's a government question, a uh, governance yeah. question, not government. No, we don't want the government in here. Don't, don't governance <laughs> question. Um, anybody, so the original idea that, well, the second original idea we had, the first original idea was that every member in our a local community just runs an issuer, you know, and we together control the profit from the toilets. <laughs> and then we thought that actually the better thing would be to um, invite all the different hackerspaces, parallelly polis, parallelna polis, whatever, to become an issuer itself and participate in the issue and then become a decentralized central bank. Really fascinating. Questions, please. We have, what, 20 minutes? Okay, I'll start from left because I, I'm sure Max has been thinking a lot during the presentation. Uh, kind of to pick up what Elena asked, uh, is the addition of a new DBC server the same as a key rotation and hash shake? No, um, it's not a key rotation, it's a vote on a new uh, contributor. So existing systems basically accept new systems. Yes, okay, but it's the same concept as in hash uh, uh, the The whole governance is he's responsible for that. So <laughs> yeah, but it's coaching. It's coaching. And then how do you use the single source of truth utilized in coaching? Um, the same thing. Um, you create the chain, the governance chain, so to speak. You publish it. Um, it's in DNS and whatever. And whoever uh, wants to use the system just downloads the code chain, verifies it through, and that's it. Did you say fuck? Can you say it aloud? He said okay, that you. word. <laughs> thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and my question is conceptual, okay? So with fiat currencies, you get like, you have, the government declares you have fiat currency. I made it so let there be light, right? Yes. Here, you, to, it seems to me you have a different system. You say, I'm smuggler. I have a cartel of digital central banks. Let there be light. I say so. There is DBCs, right? 
problem is you still have that Genesis moment, right? And I have to <laughs> trust you. Yeah. That's my question. Why should I trust you in you your Genesis moment? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. So the, this system is basically the, the front layer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't define how the Genesis exists. It's open to multiple stories. So for us, when we started the whole thing, it was about 10 dudes knowing each other and wanting to run in the toilet. You know, so that's how we started. So, and then you have this thing with hackerspaces. You know, it's our community. There's a certain form of implicit trust in the community as a whole, even if we don't trust a single node in the community. So, the whole question of Genesis is undefined. You take the system, you apply it to a social situation that you have, and that's it. However, nobody stops you from creating a protocol that selects who becomes part of it. And that is actually where the crazy part comes into play. Imagine you have actually trustworthy um, systems and you can do stuff like multi-party key generation on them. That means that you spit that system into the world. You know, people just buy there are uh, processors that are actually able to do that, like AMD Epic, you can use for that. It's a little bit expensive, but it works. And it means you have just a computer, you connect to the internet, you download the software once, and then you make a random coin flip if you become a member or not, and it's still trustworthy. And then you have whatever algorithmic scheme you want for money creation. Uh, going back to the quorum, um you said that, um, actually, is there a first question? Is there a P2P protocol involved? Or do I have to, uh, as a client, uh, connect directly to a signer? Or all of the signers? Um, you're actually, so the, the, the base protocol requires you to speak to all the signers. And the list of signers is part of the definition of the software. Um, there's optimization that you can do. And that is you can have a fan out pattern meaning you talk to one signer and the signer fans out the other parts of the transaction to others. That's why the transactions are, are constructed as, th as they are, because you can have one transaction, then it can be split off, uh, split into parts by any untrusted or, uh, party and just send it around. So you can actually minimize the amount of traffic that you have to generate as a client and then rely on untrusted parties on the net to split it to the rest of the network. So yeah, there's still a peer-to-peer -peer protocol involved? Um, it's not necessarily peer-to-peer -peer protocol, because it's a Just between the signers? Uh, no, the signers never talk to each other. Okay, okay. No. And, uh, uh, with one exception. If they vote on create mo uh, creating money, they have to you know, say, oh, let's create money. You know, that's the only moment they actually have to talk with each other. There's a moment that you can add if you really want to, and that is um, all these signers are actually auditable. You can actually um, show that the, the money in circulation in a system like that is actually as expected. And if you want to do that, they have to talk with each other as well. But within operation, they never talk with each other. Alice and Bob are pizza stores across the street from each other, but yes. they're disconnected by internet. Carl has a DBC, goes to Bob, um, and tries to pay twice, and the bloom, they both have the same bloom filter. So Carl, uh, sorry, uh, Bob knows, okay, you paid twice, it's not a double payment. Carl and the DBC is copied um, into Bob, so that way Bob knows that it's been paid. Carl walks across the street to Alice, and Alice and Bob are disconnected, attempts to copy that DBC to Alice. Um, Alice has a Bloom filter, but doesn't have any update from um, Alice. What happens? You have to encode the owner into the uh, DBC itself. So when you make a transaction to somebody, one of the options you have, it's not necessary that you do it, but for your case, you know, where you have offline receivers, you basically get the identity of the receiver, encode it into the DBC, make the transaction. And then the receiver only has to say, okay, have I seen this DVC before? If not, and you have enough signatures that are valid, then the transaction can be relayed to the network at any future time. And you can, of course, make the uh, owner assignment in a way that is untraceable, you know, it's trivial. 
The last, not question, but comment. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. I, I'm going to do the thing I hate when people do it, just add something. Oh, yeah, please do. Um, <laughs> so we first hey, I blamed you for everything, so please. Okay, <laughs> uh, first we thought we're going to get shit rich with this. Um, <laughs> but then uh, we decided that we have better things to do. So we, we're going to release everything we have, yep. all the code, everything we know about it. Um, and we would like this to you know, happen in a lot of places like this here. But we really would need some help with this, yes. especially with hardware, because we really suck with hardware. Yes, As he said, do. it's really easy to do with USB sticks, but we don't know hardware, and there's also some code to be written. So just wanted to add that. Yeah. It's really, f we, we decided, I mean, this is really a community thing, and we don't want to lock this in, so we're just going to throw it out there. And I hope this alternative reality you know, becomes an actual reality. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. I have no better closing uh, argument than <laughs> Frank, actually. Thank you very much, Smuggler. It was a pleasure to have you Thank here you. again. Thank you.